what happens when you put the British in charge of something that the French were in charge of for a long time? That is what we're going to find out today um, as we read <laughs> chapter three of Mary Winger's book, North Country, The Making of Minnesota. Our last few chapters uh, looked at the <laughs> shape and progress of the fur trade as it uh, <laughs> the Minnesota Sam's can stop the Minnesota Historical Society should start a candy line um, where they have those jokes on the wrappers and you have to open the candy <laughs> to get the punchline, <laughs> except they're all uh-huh. history based. And stupid. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. <laughs> but it's not even a joke. It's just a, uh, an in-depth explanation. No, it's just a fact. It takes the entire <laughs> inside of the wrapper <laughs> to explain. And it tastes like molasses. I'm, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm Logan Ledman. <laughs> I'm I'm Sam Temple. Welcome to uh, this podcast where we talk about Minnesota history as guided by uh, uh, Mary Wingard's North Country. So as I was. As I was uh, trying in my own particular way to say, today we're talking about what happens in Minnesota after 1763 when uh, French control of the upper Midwest is ceded over to the British. Right. Um, so so New, New France is no more. French Minnesota is no, is, is no more. Um, all that's left are some names and some illegal traders, the Coureur de Bois. Our time saying that is limited, so I'm trying to get as many in. The, <laughs> the Coureur de Bois. Um, are are still mm-hmm. there in large part because they are familial, familially, ethnically, culturally tied to the land and the people living here, rather to rather than the French nation and French empire. So they are staying in Minnesota area, um, and yeah. but the British are officially taking over, implementing their um, their trade policy. And just a, a quick quote from page 48 to, to get us going. Uh, quote, though traders in, in, in the interior understood the nuances of Indian diplomacy at a policy level, the British were blinded by imperial arrogance. Once they eliminated the, French, the, the threat of French competition, they approached the tribes as conquered subjects rather than partners and allies, end quote. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's pretty important. Because um, there, there's... Two competing kind of visions uh, in terms of what, what what does it mean when this land is no longer French, it is now British. On the one hand, it, that moment when the paper is signed, nothing changes for the people living in Minnesota. Um, like Sam just said, a, a lot of the Frenchmen living there stay, they continue to live their lives in this mixed society, this mixed culture living there. And everyone is fully aware, everyone who's living on that land is fully aware that the the king of france the king of england are not the people in charge not the people exercising power in this area it's the dakota and the ojibwe who are actually have the any any real sovereignty in the area so in that in that way the transition of power doesn't mean a whole lot right away what does change is the structure and policy of the fur trade and the like just sam, sam just mentioned the attitude that the the British government has as compared to the French government. One important, extremely important policy shift that I want to bring up uh, is mentioned on page uh, 52 and 53 of of Wingard's book, where she talks about the decision by the British to open up the fur license to anyone. First, uh, just by offering a a small fee uh, in order to obtain a license to enter the trade. However, Af- just after that, in uh, 1767, I believe, in 1767, lifting all restrictions and opening the trade to anyone who essentially had enough money to jump in. And as Winger describes, quote, the result was a free-for-all. Traders flooded into the region. Some small operators, others backed by mercantile capital in Montreal, New York, or London. Lossai fair capitalism fundamentally transformed the trade. Complex diplomatic and military obligations forged at the tribal level gave way to negotiations between individuals. So that, that's the first major shift that occurs uh, as the British exercise new policy. A, a f- flood of new kinds of traders who are not part of this French-Canadian hybrid um, society that's been built, but now British traders coming in. That's right. And uh, so, so why are people flooding in? Obviously, people in Britain, people in the American colonies 
are aware of the wealth that is accumulated. Um, some people are drawn, and we'll talk about them later in this book, are drawn to the adventurous idea in their imagination of what this North Country is like. Uh, but then there's also pieces of literature. One, in, one individual in particular, um, an explorer named Jonathan Carver, uh, he didn't actually make it very far into Minnesota, but he, he wrote a book about it and made a ton of money. It was a bestseller, and uh, it was a lot of, it, it, was, it was many people in the 1700s first exposure to this place that was called Minnesota, eventually. Um, so he has just these beautiful descriptions, these uh, exciting descriptions of the uh, the the Dakota world of the natural beauty of the land, how well the fruits and stuff grow. Sounds like he didn't necessarily stick around for winter, so I'm not sure if he wrote about that. <laughs> but uh, he made it sound yeah. very exciting and very good. So that would have certainly contributed to the the influx of traders, um, because uh, uh, the 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 trade was moving in, they had to start a lot of these relationships largely from scratch. So that meant the dynamic, the balance between the Dakota and Ojibwe, who are again, are um, coming off uh, quite a bit of conflict, quite a bit of illness. Um, both of them are obviously rather sore from how, where things left them, wh where France left them. Um, and so as they're, they're forming this trade, um, the um, I'll, I'll read this quote from page 52. Quote, official British reluctance to venture beyond their established posts had been a direct consequence of the fierce resistance they had met in Pontiac's war. Um, in the West, they were particularly distrustful of the Ojibwe's. Staunch partners of the French, the Western Ojibwe's, had supported the uprising and their Eastern relatives uh, had stormed Fort Michilimackinac itself. Despite the ban on Western trade, however, a few favored traders had uh, wheedled permission uh, to enter the upper Mississippi, and the reports they brought back of friendly Dakotas anxious to trade and soon persuaded revenue-hungry officials to reopen the gateway to the West, like Logan was talking about. If the Ojibwe's interfered with the trade, one Dakota chief assured a British lieutenant the Dakota would, quote, put them, put them off the face of the earth, end quote. The lieutenant was duly impressed, describing the Dakotas as, quote, certainly the greatest nation of Indians ever found, end quote. Unlike the Ojibwe's and most of the other tribes of the region, the Dakotas had no particular animus toward the British. For them, the French had seemed unreliable partners at best and double-dealing enemies as often as not. The British were likely to be no worse. However, their experience with the French had ensured that even as the Dakotas established trading relations, they would maintain a healthy skepticism about the British. The Ojibwe's, on the other hand, were more than skeptical. They were unabashedly unreceptive to British overtures. Um, as uh, Minna Winna, uh, chief of the Michilimackinac Ojibwe's, warned trader Alexander Henry, quote, Englishmen, although you have conquered the French, you have not conquered us. We are not your slaves. Your king has never sent us any presents, nor entered into any treaty with us. Wherefore, he and we are still at war, end quote. Only after the British sent ambassadors to offer gifts and ask for peace uh, with the Ojibwe's, did the tribes grant them, quote, the liberty to trade as formerly, end quote. So what was the relationship between the Ojibwe and the Dakotas like in this period? Well, the, uh, the ongoing war that we, that started in our, our last episode and in Mary Winger's last chapter is, is ongoing sporadically, um, throughout the 1700s. Uh, on page 56, Winger describes an army of 1,500 Ojibwe's gathering at La Pointe on Madeline Island for an assault against the Dakotas in 1765. Things come to a, a head shortly after the French cede the area to the British. So the, this, the war continues and uh, chaos continues to uh, erupt every now and then. However, as Winger writes, the border between the tribes remained largely unchanged from uh, this period of British rule. The border was never entirely quiet, but no further large-scale wars over territory occurred. 
there were raiding parties, she writes, breaching the border zone with a fair amount of regularity. But they were most often set off by personal feuds or young warriors eager to prove their bravery. For the most part, she writes, the Dakotas and Ojibwe's observed a garden detente, neither quite friends nor enemies. So that's the nature of the relationship between the Dakota and Ojibwe as they also try to negotiate this new relationship with the British. That's right. Um, Logan, I'm trying to find it. Uh, in what year does the, the new character of the Northwest Company come into play? Ooh, I think it is around there, around 57. Yeah. Oh, I'm seeing it. Uh, the emergence of the Northwest Company in 1784. 17 on page 50. On page on page 55. Thank you. Um, uh, so yeah, the the yes. Northwest Company. So that's part of. While on the one hand, uh, the the British have this laissez-faire method. Um, on the other hand, they also like essentially a monopoly. Um, they're they're, yes. they're not really too concerned about. Um, any of that. Uh, the goal is uh, about equal trade or anything like that. The goal is to accumulate wealth but also have a British presence in the area. Um, and as that's being set up, uh, most of the people put into positions of power, if not all of them, are uh, British, obviously. Um, even though French Canadians and Matisse mixed race people are doing most of the work, um, the, the, the labor, um, it is largely uh, Scots-English and uh, English settlers and in some cases, uh, you know, colonists. Um, it is a largely caste system that is built around the separation of classes, the separation of race, um, and there would generally be a, an annual meeting what's essentially you know, a river rendezvous, what they would call it, um, where they would bring basically, in theory, all of the partners of the company together um, into this, this, this party, this big company meeting, essentially. And it was just a, uh, a, a powder keg, essentially, um, with these divisions that the British society is fostering among these different groups of people all brought into kind of this stark relief altogether. Um, it's it's not exactly a, a happy a happy place, um, but one thing that almost every culture involved had in common was fondness for the drink, and that was a fondness shared across much of uh, North America at that time. Yeah, there there are numbers that uh, Mary Winard points to. Um, historian Peter Mankell's numbers that she writes about in page 58, who estimated that in 1770 America, per capita consumption of distilled spirits was about 3.7 gallons per year and on the rise, and by the 1820s it had reached 5 gallons per person among American colonials. Um, as she writes, it was a, rum was a priority item in recruiting trues, crews for a trading brigade. Men considered it a part of their pay. Traders' journals are rife with accounts of, quote, drunken frolics. And uh, a trader named John Sayer noted in his diary that he was, quote, prevented from departing until the afternoon, my men being all drunk. Uh, Mary Wingard summarizes the situation by saying that traders, voyagers, and Indians all craved alcohol as a welcome relief from the unforgiving hardships they faced each day. So the, this uh, growing dependence on alcohol as, um, well, she writes it as, she, she calls it, is, is the most valuable commodity in the fur trade by the late 18th century. Um, by, by that point, uh, when the British no longer have official control of the area, but still, set, set, in, uh, set in place by the British is this, this growing culture of uh, alcohol on the, on the frontier. Yeah, and so that's a large commodity, but there's a lot of stuff moving through here. Um, uh, yeah. They the the under the British the basically the hub of uh, you know it's called the fur trade but at this point it's obviously much larger than just <laughs> the furs um, but the hub of the fur trade moved from Michilimackinac to Grand Port uh, Grand Portage um, and we'll 
might talk a little bit about portaging, but essentially it's just moving a boat from one body of water to another, and that's how you move across North America. Anyway, it's called Grand Portage. Um, hmm. And, quote, by 1778, more than 40,000 pounds of food... Uh, oh, boy. I'm going to start that over again. Quote, by 1778, more than 40,000 pounds of goods and furs, which is foods if you put it together, um, <laughs> <laughs> made their way in and out of the region by way of Grand Portage. A village of sorts had sprung up on the spot, and some 500 people passed through during seasons. According to one trader, it was, quote, a pent-up hornet's nest of conflicting factions in rival forts, end quote. So again, Grand Portage was generally the place where they would have that river rendezvous, um, and trade tends to bring uh, people of all stripes together, not always in a fun way, especially when they're drinking five gallons of alcohol <laughs> So... Yeah. Uh, so there, there, there's, as Sam said, a lot of people coming through, a lot of different products coming through. Uh, Wingard writes in the next paragraph on page 59 about the response of people like uh, the uh, head honchos of the Northwest Company. Uh, the merchants and financiers in Montreal who capitalized the trade viewed all this competition with alarm. It was eating into everyone's profits. Uh, going on to write, in short, they intended to create a monopoly. Sorry, I forgot to gas there. Profits? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Great. It was created through a merger of private interests who could harness enormous amounts of capital to dominate the market. What they envisioned became, in fact, the prototype for the monopoly capitalism that would transform America a century later. So they this, this vision of trying to um, coalesce as many of these competing companies as possible into one group that could then dominate the Minnesota fur market. Uh, that this is going to be the, the taste and flavor of the fur trade in Minnesota for a very long time, as we'll see. Last week we were talking about risk, and now we're talking about monopoly. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, all along, we were just talking about life. Um, oh, absolutely horrible. Thank you. Thank you. Great, great work. Uh, speaking of absolutely horrible, let's talk about something that's intolerable. Um, um, oh, man. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, quote. In 1774, Parliament passed the Quebec Act, which incorporated the formerly unorganized Northwest, a territory that stretched west to the Mississippi and south to the northern banks of the Ohio, into the, provident, the, the province of Quebec. The Act reaffirmed the settlement in the region was forbidden and placed it under the authority of the governor of Quebec. The decree primarily was intended to control the northern Ohio Valley and had no practical effect on the other upper Mississippi or Lakes region. Um, but... That didn't stop, uh, end quote. That did not stop the American colonists from making it uh, among their political disputes, and they included it in their, quote, intolerable acts, um, which is, you know, for those of you uh, paying attention at home, um, we're getting awfully close to the American Revolutionary War, the War for Independence. Um, and so they included the Quebec Act, which had some nominal effect on the trade, um, but it threw people, uh, quote, the Quebec Act threw speculators once again into a panic over the value of their land holdings. Settlers already moving into the northern Ohio Valley uh, were also up in arms, and agitators for rebellion in New England declared that this was yet another of the intolerable acts. But 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 So why isn't Quebec and, you know, the these Canadians uh, part of uh, this revolution you know don't they want to throw off the shackles of empire uh, don't they want to be part of this uh, so this little section here will explain most of the reason why we're, we don't talk much about <laughs> the american revolution in the context of minnesota history quote with what one historian terms incredible stupidity the continental <laughs> congress added this establishment of popery to its list of grievances against the crown, which drove a wedge between the Catholic, French-descended Canadians and the other colonies, end quote. Uh, so, if they, it, basically, if the Continental Congress had not, uh, had not added the establishment of popery as one of the reasons why Britain was so horrible, um, there's a decent chance there'd at least be some sentiment among, perhaps, native-born French Canadians, perhaps the Matisse, or just people who are more culturally Catholic. So they lost a lot of potential yeah. <laughs> allyship there and, and throughout there. So uh, we will not talk about the revolution uh, much beyond that. There's my spiel. It's worth saying, 
it's worth saying that um, one thing that's really interesting is her sentence further on that page where she says, "By any where Wingard says, by any measure of interest, the future state of Minnesota resembled Canada far more than any of the American colonies." Uh, and that, that that's important too is that the British are moving in to the area but by the Revolutionary War it's still primarily this hybrid society of French and Indian Logan you said um, that was going to be also interesting but it did not have the word popery in it so <laughs> yeah that's 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 true I can't deny that yeah so the revolution you mentioned not not really a lot to say in Minnesota obviously most of the almost the entirety of the fighting was happening uh, far out east. However, it still had an enormously uh, a devastating effect on the people who lived here in Minnesota. You see, smallpox is what I'm talking about. Okay, um, the, do you want me to jump in and transition now? Go for okay, it. Okay, we're, we're in the 1770s. Let's talk about this. And, uh, quote, before this time, Indians in the Minnesota region had experienced several outbreaks of the disease, but it had never spread so widely and with so much virulence. Only infrequently did Europeans carry the virus to Indian trading partners in the interior. The reason for this was starkly simple. By the 18th century, smallpox had become endemic in the cities of Europe. It was the rare French or Englishman who grew to adulthood without surviving a bout of the disease. Those it did not kill became immune to future attacks. Since the virus only spread from human to human, without an infected host or recently tainted uh, belongings, the disease had no means of transition, end quote. And one such outbreak um, came to the uh, Ojibwe of Minnesota around 1779. Um, later on, I'm on page 63 now, quote, On a raiding expedition to the Missouri River, Ojibwe braves found a village abandoned and strewn with the dead. They then unwittingly carried the disease home, spreading it among themselves from Rainy Lake to Grand Portage, then south to Leech and Sandy Lakes, end quote. And this absolutely devastated uh, the, the Ojibwe community. Um, uh, an Ojibwe historian uh, projects that between 1,500 and 2,000 people died in one year alone. Um, I, we... Logan, we're recording this in March of 2021, um, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure how much empathy we need to foster for this situation. Um, the, the 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 situation being the devastating uh, impact on culture of uh, an epidemic like this. Um, yeah. But uh, we're going to do it anyway with historian Carolyn Gilman. Quote: It would be hard to overstate the effect of this epidemic on Indian society. Craft techni techniques died with the artisans, with the elders went medicine, knowledge, tribal history, religious traditions, stories, and songs. The political structure faltered when clan leaders died. People left without families had no one to protect them. And in the decades following, reports of domestic violence and murder became more common." End quote. Yeah. That's a... Uh, yeah. It's a it's it's an incredibly important situation here. Uh, Wingard writes that the Dakotas sh fared somewhat better. She says um, historians speculate that the Sioux Nation, with its nomadic lifestyle, was better able to contain transmission of the virus than tribes who lived in densely populated agricultural villages. And I, again, and this is in the context, of course, of like like Sam said, the French and uh, British traders who. And anyone who grew up in London or in uh, industrial France and then moved to French Canada probably uh, had smallpox as a kid and survived it and was therefore immune. But anyone who had been born in America, including the colonists on the East Coast and uh, indigenous peoples, did not have that exposure to the, to the virus. So it started on the East Coast among soldiers in the uh, Continental Army and it was spread from there west. Uh, which is how it got to the Ojibwe's. Yeah. And the Dakotas. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the Northwest Company again. We mentioned them briefly. Mm -hmm. So they are, are building up a, uh, a monopoly, like we said. Um, uh, they talked about the... Um, oh, let's just talk about this, actually. Uh, <laughs> so the war. Now the war that they're talking about is the uh, Revolutionary War. And, uh, quote, the war gave birth to a republic founded on a system of democratic principles. It also catalyzed a new era in the organization of the fur trade, one significantly less democratic. 
beginning in 1775, wartime shortages began uh, created headaches for independent traders. With goods in scarce supply, they were hard pressed to provision their ventures into the interior. Montreal merchants seized the opportunity to take control of the trade and began experimenting with different versions of consolidation. They put together several temporary partnerships over the course of the war and perfected the arrangement in 1784 with the founding, like we said, of the Northwest Company. And the Northwest Company, like Sam mentioned earlier, is divided along these these British lines of uh, class, race, and family. So like uh, Wenger summarizes it very well, saying a, a reified, on page 65, writing, a reified caste system evolved that reinforced the authority of the British minority and confined most French and Matisse, that is mixed race, uh, to permanently subordinate roles. Uh, in a, a line that had has a different meaning now than it did when she, she wrote it, French Canadians and Matisse voyagers, she writes, were the essential workers of the trade, and an ethnic niche they had filled for generations. Um, but they were now, under the British, uh, French Canadians and mixed ancestry people uh, had no choice but to stick to that uh, that very labor-filled life. Um, where on the other hand, the British, uh, as she writes, the bourgeois and clerks did no manual labor, never lifting a paddle or a pack. Even in their clothing, they emphasized social distance, donning frock coats and beaver hats, hardly practical apparel for the backcountry. Um, and she also writes that social and cultural distance bred disdain for the, as they called them, thoughtless French Canadians, by nature more strong and more wicked than the savages, and as ignorant. Um, ending a quote there. Yeah. So there, there's absolutely this new social hierarchy that's built by the monopolies, the British monopolies. Yeah, and you know, this is, like we said, the group that would eventually come together and do those river rendezvous at, at Grand Portage that would just make those conflicts very, very clear. Um, and not everyone was super happy, believe it or not, with this monopolistic caste system. What? <laughs> okay, I'm on page 67. Uh, quote, The limits to advancement among traders frustrated a number of the wintering partners. They also resented that as power centralized in Montreal, their influence in company decisions declined. Increasingly, the summer rendezvous at Grand Portage became a scene of stormy partners' meetings that pitted the winters, uh, the winterers against the agents from Montreal. The winterers being the people who are more involved in the yeah. actual, you know, trading, um, the thing that the company does. Uh, increasingly, <laughs> uh, I already read that. Boop 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 boop. Meetings pitted the winterers against the agents from Montreal. Uh, what McTavish. Uh, Dourly describes as, quote, a dish of Grand Portage politics, spelled uh, with a K, end quote. <laughs> um, in 1799, discontent came to a head. A group of disgruntled winters, led by Alexander Mackenzie, broke from the Northwest ranks and created a partnership of the remaining small operations that struggled against the Northwest juggernaut. The XY Company, as they called themselves, determined to challenge Northwest's control of the region setting off another round of fierce competition, end quote. And as we heard, competition is generally good for the indigenous people, um, especially coming off of um, a lot of illness and this kind of these constant bouts of, of battle among each other. Um, an influx of trade will do, will do good to provide some stability um, and the resources. And it, pr and it provides, provides some opportunity for bargaining power. Mm -hmm. The ability to say to the traders, uh, no, we're going to instead work with the XY company instead of the Northwest company, mm -hmm. um, and which is what makes monopoly so dangerous for the indigenous peoples in Minnesota, which is that if this monopoly forms, you've got only one, you've got only one person to get your goods from, and you're entirely dependent on their whims. But what weakened them somewhat was, like we said, the disease. Wingard writes, quote, Disease had been the breaking point that created dependence on the trading company. More and more of their energies had, been, had to be devoted to hunting for market, putting ever greater demands on the resources of the region." End quote. Um, so we've got over hunting, we've got this disease, we've got a lack of people to do the work. Um, and uh, um, so that, that XY and Northwest bring up some of those advantages. Uh, but I hate to say it, I hate to say it, Logan, 
Um, All right. It didn't last. Uh, you know, we, sh- we should have <laughs> known X and Y was close to the end. Uh, because, oh, boy. Thank you. Um, my life joke was better. I'm proud of that one. It that was, they, they're both great. They're all great. They're all, all great. my jokes. Wow. Uh, That's right. Everyone's a critic. Is that what that means? Um, <laughs> in 1804, so just five years after they started, uh, the Northwest Company and XY uh, merged. Um, <laughs> so that was fun. Um, but in that time, there was <laughs> a lot of a lot of strong competition. And do you know what the merged company was called, Logan? What was the merged company called? It was called this merging of the Northwest Company and XY. It was called the Northwest Company. Uh, so oh. I think they used the word merger, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's <laughs> eh, nah, yeah. I uh, I think we we get a sense of who who <laughs> wore the pants in that relationship. Yes, yes. Um, but with this competition, like we said, there is some cultural change. Uh, like we've already talked about, uh, alcohol is obviously very important to everyone at this point. Um, the teetol- mm-hmm. teetotalers don't become more prevalent in Minnesota till later. Um, yes. Uh, the ruthless Duncan McGillivray, which is uh, uh, <laughs> one of the traders in this situation, quote, when a nation becomes addicted to drinking, he wrote, it affords a strong presumption that they will soon become excellent hunters, end quote. By 1803, the two companies were annually shipping more than 20,000 gallons of spirits to Grand Portage, end quote. And that would be distributed then across across the Minnesota area. Um, uh, so there's yeah. so there's this very <laughs> this very intentional move on the part of the traders to uh, like like you were saying, Sam, in uh, or deeply weakened. Um, Dakota and Ojibwe society uh, as a result of um, the encroachments by the British and the French into this land, a, a deeply intentional move to continue to destabilize it with the mass influx of alcohol. Mm-hmm. And so, like McGillivray said, you know, uh, he's one of the heads of the Northwest Company. That was very intentional. This is when we start to see not... So, so with the French, we saw... We, would, we think we're better than the Indians, and we'd like to change them. But pretty much as soon as they had resistance to that, they abandoned that effort. Um, with McGillivray and what we'll see with other people going forward is a much more intentional and much more uh, pecuniary uh, pursuit of the destruction of indigenous life. Um, generally to the benefit of companies like the Northwest Company, but sometimes just because that's what people wanted to do. And if they happened to make a profit doing it, then that was great. Um, but some people, it's <laughs> the other way around. They just they want the profit, and if they have to destroy a culture to do it, they'll do that too. Um, so there's our introduction to that greatness. Great. Uh, so the Revolutionary War happens, <laughs> like we mentioned earlier. And the end result of that, to any uh, already history buffs listening, they'll know that uh, the Americans won the, the War of Independence. In 1783, the Treaty of Paris gave over um, British land in North America, except for Canada, to the Americans. And New Orleans. Uh, and there you go. Uh, right, except for New Orleans. However, what happens uh, a couple decades later is America gets their hands on New Orleans and the Louisiana Purchase as well. So now we have this redrawn map of North America's Wingard rights. And uh, again, as like we said earlier, this is a theme in Wingard's writing. Um, I'm looking at page 72, the redrawn map of North America with Americans now in control of the, a good half of the continent did not affect the daily rhythms of life in fur trade company. Few people in the back country had strong allegiances to one nation state or another, and governmental claims lacked any means of enforcement. However, not even the Indians felt as immune from Euro-American high politics as they had in the past. They regarded the Americans as advancing enemies who would try to strip away Indian lands as they had in the Ohio Valley. As for the traders, while at the moment they could ignore borders with impunity, they worried that if the Americans managed to assert their sovereignty, issues of licensing, tariffs, or even seizure of their posts could spell financial disaster for the trade. That's the sense among the uh, indigenous peoples and the traders as... um, the British slip away again from the continent and the Americans 
step in. Yeah, so a mixture of, of war, disease, restructuring trade, and an influx of more and more people who are less inclined and even less reliant on the indigenous people to survive. Obviously, to a large extent, anyone who is settling, settling in the North Country, settling in Minnesota, um, is going to have to rely directly or indirectly on indigenous expertise, indigenous experience, and indigenous labor to survive. But the need for that is becoming less and less as now there are generations of Europeans, generations of white Americans, generations of mixed race individuals who can provide <clears throat> provide that information, provide that expertise. Um, and because there's less reliance, there's less reliance on that for trade, less reliance on that for survival, um, we see some of those, you know, extinction measures. Uh, 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 the word extermination comes to be used in crafting policy toward indigenous people later on. Um, and, and one example that we see, you know, the beginnings, the, 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 the beginning uh, vibrations of, of uh, destruction here. Um, the, we talked about marriage last week. And one thing that Winger talks about in this chapter, and the last thing I want to I kind of leave on today, um, is the trading necessity of marriage is respected less and less as time goes on. So those kinship relationships vital to indigenous trade are being respected less and less as often now the relationships for many are viewed less as uh, you are extending your family and therefore extending your trade, but they are very much legitimate family and more transaction. Uh, and some traders even use the language purchasing or buying a wife. And that obviously is a distinct, distinct tr change from what the trading dynamic, the cultural dynamic was like in n the North Country uh, prior to further British settlement, prior to further American settlement. And that change in culture, that change in expectations and the necessity of coexistence is going to be explored and, uh, spoiler alert, further deteriorated in the next chapter. <laughs>